Oh, and then I had a couple other things. <laughs> well, we'll go. We'll get into it. It'll be fun. But yeah, yeah. we're we're recording. Yeah, I'm I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> okay, hey, hey, bro. <laughs> Welcome over fifty. Starting <laughs> over. I'm Barry Edwards, and I'm Merle Garrison, and uh, we're very prepared today. Um, so where where are we here? Um, we just kind of started rolling right in the middle of things, but. As usual. As we usually do. Oh, so I wanted to talk about just my update, as boring as this can be for some people, but I was so worried about my at-home workouts, and I'm so happy I found a groove with, as I kept mentioning, that <clears throat> that channel called The Body Project. I, I'm still using them. I found an upper-level hit uh, exercise thing. So it's a half hour of really intense, and hit is that high intensity interval training. Uh, it's a big time fat burner. I'm so hungry the rest of the day. Wow. But then, And this is the update. So then after it, I do kind of my own ab routine. And every other day I'm doing the uh, arm exercises with the rubber band thing and uh, push-ups. And while I'm doing that, okay, so after I'm done with my YouTube channel of The Body Project, I then, I decided the other day to type in inspiration. And this is what I want to talk about. This is where I'm getting at. And, and I just want to bring all that up just in case you guys at home are looking for an inspiration for your own exercise during this crazy time. And I'm just, I'm finding that I'm enjoying this. So I type in inspiration. Of course, you got a whole uh, list a mile long. And I see Matthew McConaughey's name. He's got a video. And I'm like, I kind of like that, dude. I wonder what he's got to say. He's kind of interesting. And cool. And it's a great nine minute video of him just talking, imagery changing the background, but it's just to listen to while I'm doing my exercise. And it's really great. Um, he's a pretty philosophical guy and he shares a, a lot of this and he comes out talking about, seems to me we have two wolves in us, a good one and a bad one. And if you just feed the good one a little bit more, things should work out pretty good for you. Mm -hmm. I like that as a way to start off. So it's not, it's not an inspirational video where they're yelling at you and telling, you know, it's just his kind of philosophies. I like the start of that. And he starts talking about happiness versus joy. And I would have thought prior to this that they were pretty much the same thing. But I liked his definition. He's, it basically says happiness is conditional. Like, if I get this movie role, I'll be happy. If I get accolades, I'll be happy. If I get this partner, then I'll be happy. All of these conditions, whereas joy is really enjoying what you're doing. You're not doing it for something. You're enjoying the process. You're enjoying being in the moment. You're enjoying your life. You're enjoying your day. So you're in a state of gratitude, okay? And we, that's where it always comes back to. Boy, that's interesting, Barry. Would, you know, I, I love that. Uh, both of them, the good wolf and the bad wolf, yeah. and then the difference between happiness and joy. I, I I, I'm kind of like you that, that – I may have thought that those were the same, but you know, I'm in perfect agreement with this. It, it, one thing that I would point out is, does it, as I listen to his definition on this, which you've, you've latched on to, it seems to me that joy is something that comes from within and happiness has something to do with external. It, I think it that's comes a good from the way outside. to put it. I think that's a good observation. Uh, it does. And I do know if we want to put that to your Christian terms, I know that when you feel loved uh, at that level, that unconditional love, you're going to feel more joy and more, uh, and more enjoyment in the present moment because you don't, you're not searching, you're not, you don't have that inner itch you're trying to scratch. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. You're able you to look externally more now. You know, uh, there's a scripture that says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And, uh, you know, as you talked about the good wolf and the bad wolf, I get that. I, you know, if you're feeding the good wolf mm -hmm. in Matthew McConaughey's uh, uh, terminology, mm -hmm. you're strengthening the joy on the inside of you. 
And that joy carries you through every situation. Doesn't matter what the situation is. It could be negative. I mean, look at the things we're going through right now. Oh, um, I thought yeah. it was pretty appropriate for this. Yeah, yeah. I love that. And you know, the, something I've, I've been really focused on here is, is, is feeding that good wolf as, as you would say, you know, uh, I have I have this card on my desk that I, I wrote in my own handwriting, and I think it's important that, you know, positive affirmations, I think, are very important, and, yes. uh, especially if they're aligned with your faith, yes. then these affirmations aren't just words any longer. They have life, and they have meaning to them. So I, I you know, I, I'm just going to read a couple of these, and so, a lot of them actually right. come from that book. And I want to get to, I'm halfway oh. through his. Oh, so okay. I want to get back. So you, you could go ahead. Let's, let's go ahead and we'll transition back to that. But okay. um, one of them is, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, which is a scripture. Um, so there's, there's, but the next one is, the rough is only mental. I think victory, I get victory. And that comes from that um, Power of Positive Thinking book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was actually talking about a uh, golf game he was in. And the guy shot his ball into the rough. And he's like, oh, I'll never make it over there. And the guy is like, no, it's, this is all mental. Look at this as an advantage. Look how high your ball is queued up right there. <laughs> you can really <laughs> smack it right in there. <laughs> and um, there's, there's a couple of more. I believe I'm always divinely guided. I believe I'll always take the right turn in the road which even if you take the wrong turn, it becomes a right turn with that type of mm, attitude. Yes. I believe God will always make a way where there is no way. And I don't believe in defeat. You can have losses, but don't believe that, believe that the loss is leading to victory. So again, back to mm. you, Barry, on this. Uh, but I, just feeding that good wolf is exactly where I, I boy, I really love that. That's really, and you're doing this during your workout. Yeah, which is that's the best. Like I said, you don't have to look at the screen because it's just different photos montaging in and out. Uh, so I'm just listening to it while I'm doing like my ab workout and stuff. So it's really great. And I love what you ended with about, uh, you know, our losses make us stronger. It builds our character. And remember our interview with Marcus when yes. he, uh, he quoted uh, uh, Buffett, Warren Buffett. Yeah. Uh, he would not work with anyone that hasn't failed at least two times or three times, whatever it was. Right. He wanted to make sure that they knew how to come back from failure. It's huge. I, it, it's huge. It's all the character building in the world. So to end this, I, oh, first I want to encourage everybody to listen to it for yourself. It's nine minutes. And if, and if it's something you could do during your workout, it's great. Just look up Matthew McConaughey hyphen. This is why you're not happy. And uh, it'll come right up. And so he then goes on to talk about how he feeds his five individual principles. I didn't write that down. It was something like that. And they were like, um, being a father, being a husband, um, myself, which is mind, body, and soul. Okay. And um, in friends and career. Okay, so as long as he's paying attention to those, keeping those healthy, things are good. One of them gets infected that you ignore and gets infected and it can be a domino effect and bring, mm. bring everything down. Wow. So yeah, I love that. And then this is really good too. This is kind of how it sums up a bit. And I'm paraphrasing a lot. He's like, hey, if we reduce some of our bad habits, our excesses like TV, food, whatever yours may be, alcohol, video games, uh, wherever you're wasting an inordinate amount of time, uh, we, we will inadvertently find ourselves. If you free up that time, you you're, stop feeding that bad wolf that much, and you're going to inadvertently, if even by accident, be feeding the good wolf a little bit more. Mm. And you're going to find yourself, if, even if it's by accident, your true identity, and that will increase your joy. Man. Uh, yeah, huh? That's some pretty powerful stuff, Man. Barry. 
That's what I'm, I, I I'm listened surprised. to it twice. Yeah, I listened to it twice, and I will listen to it again. Okay, so a question: Is is he, is he using the same cool voice he uses during those Lincoln commercials? <laughs> a little less Southern draw. <laughs> he he puts it on pretty thick for those Lincoln commercials. Yeah, this sounded like he was uh, doing like uh, what do you call that when you address a college graduating class? You know? Oh yeah, the uh... <laughs> yeah. I can't remember. I know. I put that. I put a brain cramp in there. <laughs> but hey. If you if you want to just move right on to you had some stuff that you wanted to talk about for the 050 segment. Well, you know, we're we're it's over 50 starting over. Right. And that's mm -hmm. exactly the position that I find myself in. I'm I'm uh, looking for employment right now and I'm in the interview process. And, and, you know, you say the word interview and people start to sweat. And <laughs> right. that is uh, a normal thing. And uh, I think judging or really piggybacking off of what uh, you were talking about is it's all in the matter of how you look at it. And sure. I, I've had several interviews here and some of them have been um, what not as good as others. And sure. Chemistry, man. You're going to hit it off with some people yeah. better than others. And I think really the attitude that you need to bring to the table is this, is that every time you put yourself into this position, it's going to be a positive. Whether you have a loss or a win, you will not be defeated. And that is the attitude to come in with. If you have that attitude, it's so much easier to relax and be yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key to having a successful interview is coming in and being yourself. You know, the fact Easier is, said than done. It, it is easier said than done. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, back to the positive affirmation things. You really have to, before you get into these interviews, meditate on the fact that no matter what the outcome is, I win. It's the yeah. right one for you at that time. And, and yeah. also that God is going to lead you to the right opportunity. Because let's face it, not every job out there that you interview for is going to be the one where your blessing is going to be. I, I've actually had jobs where I've won the position and it was a terrible experience. <laughs> and it really brought me, brought me down, like mind, body, and soul, just a uh, crushing yeah. experience. So you don't want to, just because you think that's the best place for you to be, it might not actually be the best place for you. And if it doesn't work out, you can look at it as a win. Yeah. So that's really the attitude that I, that I've gone into. If I um, could be so bold, I want to say, I want to put out there that there's two different companies vying for your talents and you're in a, you put yourself in a very good situation here. And uh, let's just speak a little bit to that because for one, the best time to look for a job is when you have a job because right. you're not desperate. Uh, but two, the best way to interview is to have opposing interviews, to have more than one offer on the table, because once again, you uh, have no sense of desperation. And you give off a different vibe, you know, when you have that, when you don't have that sense of desperation. You know, it's interesting you're saying that too, because, you know, my background is in sales and, you know, we always, it's something you talk about quite a bit is the sales funnel. Well, um, strategy, strategic approach to business is so important here. And the last thing that you want to do, a, str a strategic blunder would be to put all your eggs into one opportunity, <laughs> and that's exactly how you're going to make your number. You would never yeah. do that. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is to be upfront. Uh, you know, if you're asked during the interview, are you interviewing with other companies? Be upfront. I mean, mm -hmm. they don't want to hear that. At least I don't think they want to hear that. Nope, nope, you're the only one. And, yeah. uh, you know, especially and if you if don't hire me, I'm screwed. <laughs> that's not going to be a good position well, for you to be not. in. And not only that, once they hire you, especially if you're in sales, is that how you're going to run your business? Is right. you're going to put all your eggs into that basket? So, so be yourself, be upfront, be honest. Uh, you don't, there's nothing for you to hide. Uh, just, just 
but you know, make sure you put a positive spin on things. One thing you probably don't want to talk too much about is uh, COVID nineteen and how terrible it is out there. <laughs> how terrifying! But, but yeah, let me let me tell you this, Barry. That almost every interview I've been on, the subject comes up at the very beginning. Dude, of, it's the only subject that there is right now. And there are ways to talk about it because, he, look, I'm in the communication business and I see that there are tremendous advantages that can come out of this, this scenario that we're in. The one thing that we see right now is that everybody is having to work from home. Those that are blessed enough to have a job, they're working from home. Well, a communication platform you know, we used to always go into uh, uh, sales opportunities and talk about here's what the worst case scenario is, and you should have this platform because of this. You know what? It's not fantasy anymore. Look mm -hmm. at what's happened, and mm -hmm. people are going to be much more open to making sure that they don't that they're that they're prepared for situations like this. And I see creative opportunities that are out there that can be had. So. That's that's something uh, to talk about. And mm. <laughs> the other thing that's happened in a lot of these interviews is, mm. of course, I have this on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> and so um, Meaning right away. Over 50 starting over, yeah, the fact course, that you're a yeah. co-host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and all so, over there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all our episodes are linked up to it and everything. Right. So people bring it up right away. <laughs> I've had a great time talking about what we've been doing and yeah. how we doing it and gosh we've got over 20 episodes in so far and this is 22 i think oh by the way uh i'm sorry i'm gonna bring you right back there but that makes we haven't been talking about we are for whatever reason we're dividing it up into seasons so uh 25 will be in just a few weeks will be the end of season one and we will be on to season two after that that's kind of a big uh m monument thing what a silver we should or have on that. Pardon me? We should have a celebration. I mean, that yeah. is a big deal right there. 25 episodes, the end of season one going into yeah. season two. That's Dude, a big deal. That is a big deal. That's going to be very cool. Back to, though, you were talking about how people were, are seeing you out there as a result of being all over LinkedIn with this. We do have a good presence. So it is, and it's fun. And two things. So uh, I, was, I was following up with somebody as I was doing research on the show and uh, and I uh, I called up a friend of mine who actually works for the company one of the companies I'm interviewing with and he picked up the phone we haven't talked for several months maybe even a couple of years God. and when he picked up he said well look who it is the co-host of over 50 starting over <laughs> oh, that was so great and we had a laugh about that but he's following the show too uh Give that was a great yeah, yeah marco awesome. thank you marco for being a part of the show we really appreciate yes, that and do. then on another interview i had uh they were asking um so which one are you are you the liberal or the conservative and i I almost choked on my coffee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I one should I be? Yeah, exactly. I Is almost that... said that when I said I was the uh, Christian conservative and she said, oh, good. Well, maybe you can help me with an argument that I'm in with my sister. <laughs> uh, you know, I just love it. We've had such a great time on the show. We and, really uh, have. It's been a, a, a blessing to so many people out there. And yeah. I'm so glad that we have the, the following that we do. It's, it's been awesome. And but, want to expand, please share. Please share so that we can uh, expand our audience and continue to bring this free content to you. I, I wanted to just add one more thing to the interviewing yeah. process. Is, I got one to add too, but go ahead. Uh, have fun. Have fun with what you're doing. I've been having a great time doing this. And, you know, if you, if, you, if you bring in the right attitude, you're going to have fun. And I've met some really wonderful people that I wouldn't have had a chance to meet otherwise. Now, it's funny. Here we are in this day and age that we're in a new paradigm. All of my interviews have been over the phone. So oh, yeah. um, that's, a, that's a new thing to, to Not be Zoom. aware of. Actually, uh, phone. There was one Zoom interview that I was supposed to be on, and they they got it all fouled up before mm. the interview happened, and we turned it into a phone call, which was also uh, that was fine. But you know, uh, be prepared to to bring your personality into the telephone because mm. that's pretty much uh, how it's going to be. And one last thing is that comp 
companies are hiring right now, even though we're going through this, uh, keep a positive attitude. Companies are hiring right now. So uh, don't, don't throw in the, the towel. Keep, mm -hmm. keep on the course. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And I just, it, it reminds me of a guy I was listening to, don't remember his name, don't remember the podcast he was interviewed on, but he was an actor, didn't become a big name, but you know, he got his bit, bit parts regularly and he, he pivoted his career into like motivational speaking or career coaching, things like that. But he said, the one thing that I learned from the, the merging of these two, two experiences is if I were to do it all over again, interviewing, he was talking about. So interviewing, he said, if I, it, it's like landing a part. If I would have just been swinging uh, for the base hit rather than the home run, I would have gotten a lot more hits. Meaning, try to just get the second interview. Don't try to land the job in the first interview. Just try to get the second interview. I thought that was good advice. I think it's good advice too. And the other thing is, is that you should be interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you because totally agree. you're trying to get that job on the first interview. Well, you maybe you don't know enough about the company yet. Maybe you should find out about the company that you're interviewing with to make sure that that's where you want to be. Cause once you're in, you're in and, um, it's not only that moving all around that, that Oh, I made a mistake. That's, that's a tough thing. Go ahead. Barry. It's not only that because you'll make a better impression if you ask questions and then listen to what they have to say. People love to uh, be heard. Oh, everybody boy. does. So a great point. seriously, ask pertinent questions. For one, it makes you sound very interested in the company. But then f ask follow-up questions to those questions and listen, truly listen. It's, it is, that is the number one key to interpersonal communications at an interview level or at a freaking social party. Uh, you know what? You are... Man, you are on fire today, Harry. I got to tell you, I, isn't it a lost art today? It, it that truly people is. People don't listen. It is. Oh, it is. I I wrote in. Uh, I answered a question on Quora about this, and the question was, "How do I get people to like me?" And I had uh, five points to it, but it started with number one, and I said. The number one biggest lesson I, I ever heard, I forget where I heard it, but boy, it impacted me right away in its truth. And I was about 33 years old. Oh, I remember where I heard it, an ex-girlfriend. Um, she said, uh oh, I, <laughs> she, she said, people don't remember what you did or what you said. They remember how you made them feel. Mm. And, I, and that changed my life. Because I've always been very introverted. And when I heard that, and it just rang so true to me, it was like, oh, I'm always so introverted, say at a party or something, I'd be in my head, like most people, thinking about what I'm going to say next to impress everybody, rather than listening to what's being said to me. And that makes people feel like shit. Now, turn that and listen to them, actively listen. In other words, when they're done talking, it's what I said a minute ago, when they're done talking, ask them a follow-up question to what they just said. And then they're going to be like, oh my God, he's listening. That is the best conversationalist I ever met. And, Isn't and, that something? Yes, and smile a lot. You know, smile Barry, this is reminding me of when you and I first met in college. And um, I remember there was a party going on down the street and it was like a Friday night. And I, uh, I said, hey, I man, you got this party going on and let's go. And you said, uh, well, were, were you invited to this party? And I said, it was a frat no. party. It was a frat yeah. party. Yeah. And I said, no, I wasn't we invited. We were so far from fraternity people, man. <laughs> you were freaking out about that I whole was. thing. Like, are you I kidding? Was. We're going to go to this party? What are we going to say? What are we going to do? I don't worry about that, Barry. <laughs> it's going to be fine, man. And remember how it was? We, we ended up just meandering up into the yeah. party it was like i think it was in the backyard we meandered up and we did exactly what you're describing right now yes we yeah. were the head of the party <laughs> us in our leather jackets surrounded by people that's, in their you know, that's so funny jackets. that you remember the leather jacket part because you were like look at us we look like gang members 
<laughs> everyone was drawn to us when we went over yeah. there. And it was yeah. all because we were listening to what they were saying to us. And we were just re reacting and responding to how they were talking. And right. before we knew it, we had a huge crowd of people around us. That was one of the best nights it uh, was. in college that I can remember. It was a lot of fun. For some reason, I was thinking earlier today, what was I making? I was making something. And it made me think about the food that we used to make, the spaghetti oh. and stuff like that. We used to make yeah. some pretty Beast. killer stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you know what? You taught me a lot about cooking back mm. then. Because I, I basically, before I met you, I could make mac craft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> That's it. right. Yeah, we, we, uh, some eggs. we stretched it a little bit and uh, probably overdid the onions just once or twice. Uh, maybe more than that. But... <laughs> Uh, oh, remember that pot roast we made? I oh, do. Gosh, that was, I do. My mouth is watering. I, I, to this day, it is my duty with Lisa and I to make a pot roast once a year at around February, something like that, sometime during the winter. Best time. It, it is. And oh, God, I, I, I got it down. I alter my, I keep my recipe, look it up once a year. And I just, I just improve the notes on it each and every year a little bit. I try a little something different. I, I put it in my notes. Love oh, that. it's so good. It's uh, so good. You, you know, right, what, what are, getting back, <laughs> I wanted to get back to the whole listening thing. I, I just yeah. tribute to my mother. And it's uh, active listening. Yes. Is the key. I have learned so much from my mom. She is probably the best listener that I that I know. That's a uh, huge compliment. She and, and she, it's not just with me. I mean, I see her with other people. She mm -hmm. she's really listening to what you're saying and and catering whatever response that she has to what you're saying. And and you always come away with conversations with her feeling so good about yourself and because about the conversation. Heard. Right. And here's something else that she does is that uh, she could be talking, she'll always give you the right away. Like if you start to say something, she, whoop, she backs off and she just listens to what you have to say and lets the conversation flow that way. It's very humble. She is. She yeah. is. Man, I am. <clears throat> love You're you, Mom. She's so yeah. awesome. Okay. Get myself all choked up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Where are we going from here? So did you want to add any more to the interviewing? Uh, you check your notes. No, no. I got everything. Okay. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but I think those are, those are tips to live by. And I think yeah. even, uh, you know, outside, if you're in a sales opportunity, those same things work. You know what? I, Lisa has talked about uh, wanting at some point when she feels good about it to come on here and talk about her experience. There's something about uh, job hunting that she is exceptional at, and that is using LinkedIn like a ninja. And so when she's applying for something, you know, she really goes after what she wants. And so when she targets something, she, of course, she then finds somebody, as many people as possible that she is either a first connection to or even a second connection to that she can get a referral to for that place. And I, I don't know if you do that. But oh, I, absolutely. Okay. LinkedIn it's is huge. such a powerful tool. I mean, don't mm -hmm. underestimate LinkedIn. And you know, what's also cool is uh, you can see other people's activities and what they've been doing on LinkedIn. And, and that gives you a lot of leverage to have talking points. Uh, the other thing too, is look at their recommendations and look at what other people are saying about them too. There's so much good stuff regarding LinkedIn and getting mm -hmm. referrals and things like that. It, boy, I really love that. Too. It's probably the number one tool I use in the process. I would say it is for everybody in the job hunting process. I, my, my, only, uh, my only point to that is I think most people need to use it to its potential and uh, more to its Who potential. does? Because yeah. there's so much potential and you could probably start a business just teaching classes on how best to use LinkedIn. Well, a lot of people do just that for sure. Oh. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> I thought totally... I had a multi-million dollar idea right there. <laughs> <laughs> Not lots of people have, you know, see Facebook ads for it and all kinds of stuff. You know, I was just I was taking a walk. It's a really beautiful day today. And I've been walking a lot because of the state that we're in now. Uh, it's nice to get outside. It's so mm -hmm. nice to get outside. And 
Uh, I think it's important, this wasn't my original point, but I think, it, I just wanna say, I think it's important for everybody to try to get outside safely as much as possible because nature has the calming effect versus the kind of anxiety and depression that can build slowly over time in the situation that we're in, especially if you got the news on in the background. Oh, Please don't yeah. do that. Yeah, don't do that now. Um, it's, it's hard to overcome. They're, they're competing fiercely to find the worst news in this bad situation. And uh, I, I see the people, uh, whether it's on the Nextdoor app or personal friends of mine, I see who's watching uh, the mainstream news media a, a little too much, a lot too much. It's pretty evident uh, when you see that. And um, boy, I tell you, we just had the mayor of Los Angeles come out yesterday and recommend that everyone going outside wear a mask. Really? And, yeah. And so, uh, well, I was, I was kind of angry when I heard that because I was also hearing that uh, not to use the N95 masks and oh. that those are only for healthcare workers, but you, you use a bandana. And I started thinking, wait a second, I can't use the N95, but, but the healthcare worker can, I'm not They're supposed to use that. What is it? But then I heard more information about it and it was really don't, try to buy the N95 masks because they want to save those for the healthcare workers. Right. Sure. And what they're really trying to do here and accomplish here is not so much that you don't get the coronavirus, but that you don't spread it right. out of your mouth through the, I guess, the droplets or whatever mm. that come out of your mouth. And I started thinking, well, that's actually a, a pretty good idea. Mm. I, I uh, had an experience the other day where I went to the supermarket and I did wear a mask. And I got to tell you, Barry, that takes some getting used to. I, uh, I did I, not I like that. I felt yeah. sort of oppressed behind that whole thing. And I was hot. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's not a, it's, it's not, I, I love going outside, like you're saying, mm -hmm. and I want to go outside, but that is a little bit of a demotivator. Oh, it really is. And uh, I just got back uh, from the store before this podcast. And like you're saying, uh, you know, everybody, they're very adamant, even with tape uh, on the lines for the cashier register and stuff to yes. keep you six feet apart and everything. It, it really is disconcerting. You're talking about how you're feeling, you feel oppressed wearing the mask. I was feeling like uh, it was apocalyptic, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to be on the other side of this soon enough. What I was wondering and what I was thinking about when I was walking earlier was I have no idea how to process this one, but the government throwing $2 trillion into the economy to stimulate us and hopefully keep us from going into a depression and so on. How, how do we recover from that? How long does it take? This is completely unprecedented. I'm not asking this in a panic mode. I'm asking it in, I've never heard of anything. Here's the only context I could put it in is when this happened after the banking crisis of 2007, eight, uh, and Obama just printed up a shitload of money and threw it in the economy. I learned at, at around that time that what we do is as the economy gets better and better, we slowly raise interest rates. So that is when the government literally with the extra money coming back in via interest is literally taking it and burning it out of the economy. So yeah. how do you do that with $2 trillion? Can you wrap your head around a trillion? You can't. No, you can't. <clears throat> it's it's a boy. You're making some great points here. And and back during the Obama administration, they were consciously trying to keep the stimulus package mm -hmm. below a trillion dollars. It was yeah. somewhere in the nine hundreds. Uh, this last stimulus was the largest stimulus package that the United States has ever passed. Uh, Two trillion dollars is something that we cannot wrap our heads around. But if you take a look at the gross national product, it's below. Uh, it's below $20, $20 trillion a year, and that is how much the everyone put together makes in the country in a year. So if you take a look at $2 trillion, that's, uh, that's about 10% of our GDP that we're looking at right there. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that is going to be 
something that our children and maybe our children's children will be paying off. And the interest on that alone is tremendous. Here's the thing to take a look at, Barry, is what is included in the $2 trillion? And I don't think a lot of people are looking at that. But I suppose to. Well, I think that's the worst part about the whole thing. Mm. First off, when you take a look at the, the bill itself, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. And I think that should be a red flag in itself yeah. because when you take a look at how this country is run in the first place, it's a less than 10 page document that runs the, the entire country called the constitution. Mm. So how come it takes, uh, you know, a thousand pages to put a stimulus package together? Being I mean, political. You could, yeah. If you were going to get a, a contract from the bank for a loan and it was hundreds and hundreds of pages, you would get your attorney to comb through that to look at how you could be getting ripped off. And I'm telling you that if you look inside of this mm. bill, there is a lot of, a lot of fat inside of this bill, including raises uh, for yeah. Congress including uh, miscellaneous spending funds, including things that absolutely have nothing to do with the coronavirus. So it, and, and here's the thing that's concerning to me is when I first saw this pass, it was 96 to nothing in the Senate. And I thought, finally, uh, these guys are getting serious and they're all on the same page. But the more I thought about it, the more I became concerned and started to think, wait a second, if they're all in full agreement about something, what's in it for them that's causing them to be in full agreement? Very astute. Yeah, they don't. They never miss an opportunity to grease their palms a little well, bit more. Well, it, it's it's uh, Rahm Emanuel said it the best: never let a good crisis go to waste. And um, mm. when you take a look at this and you start to compare this to other opportunities for a good crisis. Uh, look at 9-11 and look at what happened a after 9-11. Sure, we had a lot of patriotism and a lot of people came together and they passed the Patriot Act. Well, mm -hmm. the Patriot Act is still ongoing. We gave away our privacy rights through the Patriot Act and it's never been given back to us. Look so what when Edward Snowden risked. Well, I mean, his entire freedom. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, Rex Lee, put yeah. together an article the other day. He wrote for the Vision Times. This is uh, part one, and it's called uh, The Hybrid Warfare, Are You Prepared? And it has everything to do with, um, with everything that's going on right now. And you know, and, and especially with the never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. um, we're taking a, what is a hybrid warfare though? I've never actually heard about this until Rex brought this to my attention. Now Rex is a telecommunication guru. He spent his whole career in telecommunications. Uh, now he's actually an advisor to people in Congress. He's written plenty of articles for the Epic Times and um, <clears throat> he's done a lot of research into our communication infrastructure and how it's been used. But this uh, hybrid warfare was brought on by the key driver, which is the re-rise of the great power competition between the United States, the European Union, the United Kingdom, Russia, and the Chinese Communist Party. And we're seeing this played out on a, on a large scale right now. The, um, he's, he's actually making a great comparison to this uh, through the book, The Art of War by Sun Tzu, which is a Chinese military strategist. And this book was written in the fifth century, but it's, uh, it, it really, he's pointing out that there is nothing new. And let me just read something from that art, from that book that will ring true today. It says, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. The greatest weakness is that which requires, I'm sorry, the greatest victory is that which requires no battle. So as we take a look at our, our, our times today, here we are, we're sitting inside of our houses right now. We're not interacting with anybody. Um, we're, we're, we're actually- not making money. We're, we're, we're afraid of everybody and, and going on with the not making money. Now we're all almost a hundred percent dependent on the government. Yeah. Um, 
you know, we're changing our set. We go to the supermarket and it looks like a Cuban supermarket in there yeah. where there's no food on the shelves. Uh, we've changed ourselves into a seemingly communist government overnight. Like and we're all in compliance with this. We're not fighting it whatsoever. In fact, we're doing it on our own volition. We're staying at home and we're, 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 we're giving accolades to the government and saying, mm -hmm. oh, thank you for spending $2 trillion. Um, and it, locking it, us down. And not telling us exactly what's inside of this. Mm -hmm. um, the article goes on to talk about this hybrid war, and I, I just wanted to read this. Hybrid warfare simply means that the modern battlefield is everywhere, and targets include companies, governments, armed forces, and even civilians, including adults, teens, children, doctors, lawyers, judges, government officials, artists, entertainers, and business professionals. He goes on to talk about how this is actually working in these various um, sectors of our of our daily American yeah, lives, pharmaceutical. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, yes, where uh, you you're bringing up great points here, Barry. Merle, where they are. Go ahead. I heard today. I didn't know this statistic. Ninety seven percent of our medicines, pharma, pharmaceuticals, are made in China. Now think about this. Think Barry. about that. If that's the truth. All they have to do is disrupt our supply chain, and that brings us to our knees. Yes, it does. Yeah. One we of the things that start taking that, this seriously. You know what? I, we've talked about China plenty of times before the COVID nineteen came mm. out, and what a threat China is. Remember yeah. when we talked about the, the space uh, wars? Exactly. Dude, that's that's still it's that it's is. bone chilling to me. The space wars thing. Now think about now we got this. this. Yeah. Well, think about this. Um, there is a precedent here that these types of hybrid wars that have been fought in the past have always led to conventional wars, or yeah. many times led to it. You know, the history of World War II is that we, as America, saw China and and actually Japan uh, invading China, and because we had interests in China. Back in uh, 1940, what we did was we had a an oil embargo set up against Japan because they have no natural resources. They actually had to go to China to be able to get this, mm -hmm. which is really the prelude to Pearl Harbor and yeah. the beginning of our intervention into World War II. So these are things to really keep an eye on. It is. Let's continue to define the hybrid. Uh, war. Is it war? hybrid war? Words yes. On? Okay. Uh, we only touched upon it, but so Apple uh, tech companies like Apple are dependent on the labor over there. We just discussed oh, yeah. the pharmaceuticals, uh, the tampering with elections. This is 21st century, like passive aggressive warfare is what it yeah. is. It's so insidious. Well, but it's in 21st century shit here. Yeah, and being able to say, it, it, you, brought, you brought up Apple. Okay, well, let's say we decided, okay, we don't want to do business with Foxconn any longer. That's the company in China that produces all the Apple phones. Okay. Let's do that here in the United States. Well, how are you going to have a competitive product against mm -hmm. China now? Mm -hmm. We've got regulations that are put in place that would not allow us to be able to a put together facilities fast enough and b we can't the pay the people the same price that is being paid in china because they're paying them little kids slave labor it's slave uh, labor and, and, and we're all good with that we just don't think about it we don't talk about we don't it. we don't and, talk about it and it is uh hypocritical it, it, it permeates its way through the entertainment industry uh he talks about the nba I forget oh, the particulars, yeah. but the, yes, the Houston Rockets. Yes. Right. But what, how is, uh, I forget, how is China in the pockets of the NBA? Well, sure. China has a big, big presence within the NBA because of the marketing that they do in China with the 6 billion people that they have there, uh -huh. which is also where all this advertising goes, where they are very much invested in Nike, mm -hmm. which uh, is making them billions and billions of dollars. And so if you, <clears throat> if you interfere with the Chinese market, you're interfering with the revenue coming in. I'm sorry with the nba uh you're you're interfering with 
the revenue that's coming in, a big revenue stream that's coming into China. Mm -hmm. So um, this is why we had these remarks about Hong Kong uh, when the, uh, the, I guess it was the coach of the, of the Houston Rockets was saying something about protecting Hong Kong and their their freedom of speech there. And uh, everyone in the NBA, they made them apologize for saying that. Now, I this is really was- interesting when you look at it and you go back to what I said about the art of war is the best war uh, fought is one where you actually never have to fight. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when this whole thing in Hong Kong started to happen and you had all these protesters in the street, my worst fear was that you would see the Chinese military subduing these people in the streets. Well, think about this. That would have been a big, big negative for the Chinese government that, oh yeah, look at this communist government. They're beating up people. They're killing people in the street. Well, now the people in Hong Kong aren't in the street anymore because of the Mm COVID-19. And they are actually inside, staying away from everybody else. And they're thinking that they're actually protecting themselves from doing this. So in other words, the Chinese government wins and they didn't even have to fight a war. Now, I'm not saying that they, winning right now. I'm not saying they spread the COVID-19 on purpose. I don't know that. Mm-hmm. But what I am saying is that they used the occasion to be able to create an advantage for themselves and win a battle without ever having to fire a shot. Yeah, and that's true, man. It's kind of like 9-11. Uh, these people, uh, like the terrorists in 9-11, they have found that they can use our freedom against us. You know, look at Italy. Italy went into dire straits because they were exercising their, their freedoms a little too much, you know, yeah. and uh, that turned against them quickly. We found with 9-11, oh, the development of the TSA, we at least found out about the NSA, as you right. said, the Patriot Act, all of that. They use our freedoms against us. And right now, look, look at the state we're in right now. Well, it's uh, it's an amazing thing. And as a constitutionalist, I have a lot of concern about this because we take a look at um, Bill de Blasio coming out last week and saying that um, he was willing to shut down churches and synagogues permanently if they continued to get together for services, not just during the COVID-19 threat, mm-hmm. but permanently. Interestingly, he never mentioned mosques. I thought that that was um, a very big red flag when you hear government officials threatening your freedom of speech and freedom of religion under the guise of a, a, a threat like COVID-19. I mean, where does it end? Yeah, for sure. Uh, did he just, uh, as governor, he's the governor, right? No, he's the mayor of New York. N- okay, New York. Governor's Cuomo. Governor Cuomo is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Did Cuomo just simply not react fast enough with New York? Or yeah. is it, you know, New York's such a different place, you know, where everybody lives in their one bedroom, tiny apartments and just sleeps there and then they're out. There's the most social city on the planet, you know, crowded. I, I kind of feel like this whole uh, so-and-so didn't react fast enough. They didn't react fast enough. I kind of feel like that's an unfair statement that's being huh. used to, for purely politics right now. Sure. I can't tell you if somebody's reacting fast enough or not. I mean, they're definitely blaming the president for not reacting well, fast enough. Well, that's the politics of it, yes. It, it, it is. And, and so this is the thing, and I, 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 I think about this quite a bit, is the media seems to be a propaganda arm anymore. And the more we hear what's happening in the news, the more I think we as individuals have to question, what is the motivation for them to say this? Mm -hmm. And what advantage are they getting out of saying this? Um, I, I, I find that it's more important now to read between the lines than than any other time in, in my life. Agreed. Agreed. Everything that the mainstream media does with uh, the news today is to simply feed the Trump derangement syndrome. It's an addiction and it's easy to feed. And the thing is, if everybody wants to blame Trump for a so-called lack of inaction, I asked about Cuomo because he's governor of New York. Okay. Uh, Our states are given 
are intentionally given individual freedoms because they're very different. New York is very different from Ohio. California is very different from both. All right. And Utah or Idaho, a whole nother thing altogether. So Boy. it is up to the individual governors to handle their state correctly. You can't just expect Trump to stamp, put a stamp on a set of rules for all 50 states. Boy, if yeah. you did, wouldn't that be a fascist government? That's exactly right. Boy, you yeah. are right on again. I'm you're rolling on fire today, today, dude. You are on fire. Well, <laughs> We're going and if an extra you look, hour. look at our history too, Barry, is that it's the states that came first. Right. The states and the local government came first, and they're the ones that created the federal government. Right. They're, and so our freedoms are supposed to go local government, and first the individual, then local government, yes. then state government, then the federal government. We've federal government has gotten down. far too big. Oh, absolutely. It is upside down. Yeah. Yeah, we've turned it upside down, and you're so astute in, in saying, okay, what about the governor? Because New York is different than Iowa. They've mm -hmm. got, New York is different than Idaho. They've got different prerogatives. They've got different priorities. They've got a different demographic that they're yes. dealing with, as you mentioned. And that is really- There is no place like New York City in, no. in the world. You know, um, it, it has to be dealt with at, at, at its own individual level. But that's what I question. Instead of playing the blame game, I really, uh, I'm trying to show empathy for their lifestyle. New York is so different. That's like I said. So you got a uh, a couple of roommates living in a one bedroom apartment, and or a family of four in a two bedroom. Uh, domestic violence incidents have got to have gone through the roof. I would think. The Boy, that is something to really pay attention to right now. You know, uh, I remember one of my friends, Darren, uh, was living. He moved to New York City many years ago, and I remember visiting him, and 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 he took me to his his new apartment that he was paying a fortune for. Oh, sure. And I remember we, he opened up the door and I was like, well, where's the next room? I mean, dude, this was much smaller than my dorm room, my freshman year of college. Wow. And he was paying thousands of dollars a month for this place. Can you imagine being quarantined no. in a place like that? No, I could never imagine living in New York city. Uh, Lisa neither. and I were just there a couple of years ago. We did the uh, five borough bike ride, which was a blast. Oh, yeah. It's a great way to do the city, 30,000 bicyclists and everything. Wow. Uh, and I would do it again. I, I really love doing it. And, but that's about the only way I want to go to New York. I, and Lisa feels the same way. Do not like that congestion. Do, I love, uh, you know, nice big house, yard and everything. It's, uh, it's very yeah. freeing. And uh, New York, like I said, you, you have that little tiny place just to sleep. And then as soon as you get up, it's all about being out there. And I would feel like I'm at work. As soon as I leave and get out on those sidewalks, the heavy bustling and uh, the stress and everything's always moving, yeah. the city that never sleeps. Not for me. Mm -mm. Now, that's, that'd be a tough, uh, a tough transition from where you are to New York City. That's yeah. sure. and, and even here in Los Angeles, I mean... Uh, I don't have a yard. I would love to have one. I, we were watching the news last night and somebody on the news was talking about how they were doing yard work and mm. picking oranges and everything. But and you still out. have a little patio. I yeah. Mean, I yeah. I, I have a little patio, but everyone's dog pees right outside of my little patio and it stinks <laughs> out there. <laughs> <laughs> so you know I, I, we don't go out there uh, okay. we'd like to so i guess uh, you know we, we hey improvise that's what we have to do we have to improvise you know i guess we got to put our masks on and and still you know get on our bicycles or go for a ride but uh, uh man there's a lot of adjustments that are to be had and made right right around these times and, yeah and then the good news is this is that we as a country have been through so much worse. And uh, I'm reading a book by Martha McCallan right now called Unknown Valor. Uh, that's her new book that she has out. And it's about um, from Pearl Harbor to Iwo Jima. She, one of her uncles actually fought and died at Iwo Jima. But as you read through the account of what the country had been through, this is really well written, by the way. Uh, boy. If we can get through that, we can get through this. That mm. is oh, for sure. You know what? It just occurred to me. We got we really went all over the place. I don't, did we button up that conversation about that article on the? Uh, 
Well, he, in, in order to button up the article, it's a great article. It's coming out in the Vision Times. It's, uh, it's a part one. He's got a part two that's coming out as well. And we're thinking about having Rex Lee uh, on a special edition very soon so we can have a, a very interactive discussion about this because it's important, it's interesting, really important. and I think people need to be aware of what's happening with this whole thing. You know, it brings up a lot of philosophical discussions, though, because... Uh, I am honestly, I'd never really say this, but my, my beliefs, my political beliefs and social beliefs pretty much align with the libertarian philosophy. Right. And, uh, but there's just, they only have crackpots that actually run for president. It's embarrassing. So I don't, I just say independent, but I've always aligned with about everything except they were always, when I was studying them more, it was at least 15 years ago, but uh, I aligned with just about everything, how, you know, they want everybody created equal, all equal, equality and races, sexes and all of that stuff. Fis fiscally conservative, want a small government, but they also tend to lean towards isolationists. Uh, and I always thought you can't, that's actually impossible. It, it's too simplistic for one. You need to make allies in order to defend yourself against real threats, but also the real threats can become allies over time. So, I mean, I, I don't believe in the isolationist thing. And especially so then as we got in the internet age, all of a sudden here we are, we're talking about this in the 21st century, how we have this insidious kind of war going on uh, economically with us, really under the radar with the pharmaceutical industry. We didn't even talk about in Hollywood how they strong armed them into censorship over certain things that it seemed to be anti-China. And, um, oh, what was my end point to that? I'm, well, you were talking about oh, isolationism. About isolationism versus uh, being very uh, interdependent. And uh, when you got a threat as big as China, I mean, this is, this is not a conversation that we can come to conclusions on in no. a couple hours, but we need to start having the conversations. Well, Everyone. and you're making such a good point, too, because, look, if we had followed the isolationist policies of the Libertarian Party, we'd probably not be in as big a mess as we are in right now. Mm -hmm. um, you take a look at uh, the fact that we, we, just as you brought up, all the pharmaceuticals that we outsource to China, if we were doing those internally here in the United States as a policy because we don't want to be interdependent on Mm -hmm. possible enemy countries like the Communist Party of China, then we wouldn't be in a stronghold with them where we have to play nice with them. Uh, when the situations like this happen, we could be more dependent on our own things. Apple wouldn't be stuck in a situation where, hey, we have to do business with China. Where else are we going to go? And when you start to look at how the Chinese government has stolen our uh, intellectual property by embedding into telecommunications products and infrastructure oh, surveillance right. mechanisms. Surveillance. If it has and, a camera and a microphone, they're collecting information. Yeah, look at this. And so again, back to the isolationist philosophy, maybe we did ourselves a huge disservice by making ourselves so interdependent on other countries but hey there's nothing we can do about that now what's done is done it's how do we go forward we need ideas on how yeah. we go forward true uh and we don't know what our deeper level government agencies are doing about it you know when we always all the buzz has been about our elections being hacked russia 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 what the hell do you think we're doing to them you know we don't talk yeah. about that no, we're, we're the good guys. Yeah, we're the good guys. Yeah, Merle, we are at an hour or maybe a touch over. Want to wrap it up? Yeah, this has been a fantastic conversation. It uh, is. We had a lot of good positive stuff that we talked about in the beginning, but uh, then we talked about real stuff too. Yeah. I just want to say again that, um, you know, this is, uh, this is only temporary. The things that we're dealing with and how we're, we are isolated in our houses right now, it's tough to go outside. But I say this, 
look at this as an opportunity to make the best of yourself while you're in this isolation. Read books, exercise like Barry's suggestions that he has. Um, you know, foster relationships over Zoom or Skype with Keep your them other up. Yeah. members. You know, yeah. reach don't out to some people you haven't talked to in a while. Don't don't put yourself in a situation where when this finally lifts, you're in a you're in an even worse situation than you were when you came into this. We have Make opportunity. the most of this. Yes, there mm -hmm. there's definitely opportunity. And just like I said, if you think victory, you'll have victory. And I just believe it. And I know it'll be true for you too. Yeah. And so thanks a lot, guys. And please don't forget to uh, email us at mail at over50startingover.com and check us out at over50startingover.com. You can uh, get straight to our YouTube channel or your Apple podcast, Google podcast and all that stuff. Leave some comments for us. Share. Please share. We want to grow our audience and give us a like or two. So thanks a bunch, guys. We'll see you next week. See ya. <laughs>